Welcome back to Get With The Programming. I am Chase Ingram. I'm Captain America. And along with me is Bill Grumler. Wolverine. Bill, you look good. Damn, you look good, bro. You look, is that a new shirt you got on there? You know, it is. <laughs> Take a look at it, if you would. Drink it in. That's right. That's a three-quarter length baseball tee cult shirt in all black for Billy. Yeah, because, you know, got, that's the way I rock that all black. I've got the... I call this tan. I don't. You guys, you called it like an olive green the other day. I think. It, I think it's like a green. I think it's like an olive green. Oh, uh, you, know, you know, my whatever my tomato, eyes, tomato. I got a little baseball tea action. OG plus our sick hats. Sick hats. Sick and here I'm going to show you my OG underwear right now. <laughs> the the collection continues. Uh, <laughs> if you guys are out there and you saw some um, hints by Sherpa Works, shout out to this. Yeah, flags, flags are in. Oh man, I can't Jim, flags wait. are in. I cannot wait. I can't wait either. So we'll post some of those things as they come up. But we got a fall line coming. This is a little preview. Baseball tees, baby. Uh, they're I so can't cool wait too. The joggers. Yeah, that's gonna be I, sick. I, you know, I I have I really like the. Uh, I don't know where he gets all of his products from necessarily because i mean like we're all we're all gyms and like yeah. we all order shirts and whatever and i mean unless you get the classic um like the 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 bella the canvas you know or the what's the other one that everyone always gets not uh, i don't know you know what i'm talking about yeah I but it's like it's like the same ones all the time and then like you try to do like the one-off ones on the store and they always end up being like gildens Oh, yeah. To the loom or something <laughs> stupid like that. I'm like, God dang it. No, not yes. that. But his shirts are always so great. They're so comfortable. They're so soft and they fit so well. I mean, this yeah, makes yeah. me look like I have like shoulder muscles. I mean, check it out. I got a trap right the there. Hiller's right. dismay. I got, I got a trap right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, did I tell you, he mentioned this on one of his shows. He's, he, he saw me at the games and I was like, hey, man, what's up? And he goes, the first thing he said, he goes, you are much taller than I thought you were, and your shoulders are way smaller. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thanks. I think the first thing I said was, wow, dude, you're shorter than I thought you'd be. <laughs> I think that was a common one he got a lot of. But <laughs> it, I, must I mean, a, it must be the camera angle, angle, you know? Yeah, the, the upward look, but uh, it was pretty funny. Yash, how, how tall? I'm 6'2", 215. So, I mean, there you go. above average. If that's... <laughs> That's what we want to do. But welcome, everyone, to the Glassman Chipper, our CrossFit Journal book club. Lucky for you guys, we have two. Two for you. Two and for, two. Two for, for the two. last three, we went through Foundations, Garage Gym, and What is Fitness. You guys can look at those. They're already in there. They're set up. And today, we're going to do how to train for a sub-minute or sub-seven-minute 2K, which is has its own implications and adaptations. And then the other is the ring muscle up. And I think what's cool is that we've done a lot of, this is a lot of what you see in a level one. We've done yeah. a lot of theory and now we have movement application. And that's what all this is from, right? This isn't like a chronological thing. This is just a bunch of things put together that Glassman loved that we're going to go through. And today we got two. Well, I, I, you just like what we do, we answer like people in a gym. We we start seeing what kind of problems are everyone have, what kind of questions are everyone having. If we if we watch the workouts and we start seeing that everyone is cleaning, they're pulling wrong, they're doing this wrong, they're doing that wrong. We as programmers think about that and it's like, okay, maybe it's time to put in some drill work or some accessory work or something to get this fix this hitch and answer this question that a lot of people are having. And and you know, back then, if you think about all of the things that he is kind of going through, that's what he's doing. He's answering. Why are we doing this? OK, well, that's the, what is fitness? Mm. Well, to do that, you have to have a certain foundation at your level. So what are those foundations that we're all working off of? OK, well, if you're at home or if you're trying to do it in your gym and it sucks, go to your house and do it. But here are the things you're going to need. Oh, well, now that you have these things at your gym, now you have to figure out how you're going to do them. And how you're going to work through these movements. And so let's go over some of the movements that you have. What I think is interesting is, yes, there are going to be some how to's, but I really think that in the both of these articles, that's very surface level. It gets down to showing to the core part of 
what are all of the different ways to achieve your goal? Here are three different ways to go about getting this goal. It's not just always row more. It's not just a, it's like fling yourself up over the rings and you're going to get it. It's like, here are some steps. Oh, you're missing up on this step? Well, why don't you try this thing? So what I like about it is it is it is um, surface very technical, like do X, Y, Z. But you go just below that and it's like, hey, this opens the door up to a lot of different ways that we could get to this goal and still have a, you know, going the constantly varied aspect, especially ways to get there. So it's not just always a straight, you know, uh, strength progression that we, that everyone normally does. It's not mm -hmm. a pyramid setup every single time. It's not always this. You could do those, but you can do all these other ways too. And I, I, I even the rowing one, like I thought the rowing was going to be honestly. Yeah. Hand, and, I, and I, this is full <laughs> admission. When you said that that's what it was last week. And I remembered I, I pulled it up. I was like, Oh, that's going to be fucking boring. Yeah. Right. Really? Was like, Two pages. <laughs> dumb. But if you think Hard about all the different ways. Yeah. But if you if yeah, once yeah. we get into it, I like that it opened the door for programmers and for coaches, especially. Look, you have a variety of different ways. We talk infinitely scalable and, and ways to modify to get to that goal. And this just opened up and reaffirmed that. So I, I it's actually really I think it's a really fun setup once you get through. Mm -hmm. that regular deal. You know what I mean? It's cool. Yeah, I totally agree. Cause reading through it, even though it was only two pages long for the, the row one, the muscle up that we're going to hit right after this is three, but it's one yeah. movement. But like you yeah, said, yeah. it, it's cool because how there, there really is like, okay, how you prep for this can translate to so many other things. Yeah. And I like when we see that with say, when we think about what we get excited for, say during the open or regionals, sectional, semifinals, whatever they're freaking called now. And the games is like, oh, that event opened up a whole new world of programming yeah. for me. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, the way you train for this specific, say, test can also open up a lot of different training avenues and things to think about when you do that. And, yeah, I thought that was really cool. Um, before we go through, I'd like to – my wife just announced this to me. I'm at home. She's actually in the office next to me. And uh, moment of silence or condolences that the Queen of England just died. It's like just I saw something like, that she was I in the hospital or whatever, but like, holy shit, no way. Yeah. Like, yeah. So is, it, is she like the longest running monarch? She my, my wife told me because my wife just watched The Crown, which is some Netflix thing about how she came. I don't know. It's a Netflix show. Yeah. And I think seven decades she spanned. Holy shit. Yeah. Which is crazy. So she got in there oh. when she was seven, huh? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, I don't know when it started or, or how Damn. old she actually was. But, I mean, if she's 80 or 90, I'm like, pff, she's rolling in there at 20-something. Wow. I mean, wow. yeah. So, uh, yeah, soccer mom, 14 presidents worth, 70 years as the Queen of England. But, yes, a uh, little... You know, rest in peace. 96, Corey just put up there. Oh, what, right. what, 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 that? damn, I should probably watch this show. Things I just didn't know. <laughs> 96. <laughs> so. All right. Wow. So, uh, yeah, just, uh, you know, just wild. Wild. Coronation is 1952. Look at all you guys with your fun facts. Thank you for looking up. Yeah, Wikipedia is a hell of a thing. Wild. Wow. All right. I'm going to pull up the article. I dropped two links here in the chat on YouTube. They're also in our YouTube detailed description. I'm starting to put those in. Thank you for the feedback for a lot of you guys that are listening. And we'll go through the how to row a sub minute, a sub seven minute 2K. Now, the what's the time equivalent for uh, for women? You, would you guess? Uh, so I would say like 720. Okay. Well, okay. So, so what do they do at the games for the thousand? Um, three fifteen for a thousand. That was their like cutoff time. Yeah. Is that correct? So double yeah. that six thirty yeah. so plus. So women sub twenty. So I was seven twenty seven thirty seven forty. I would say somewhere around the seven thirty. I'm bad, I'm bad at yeah. these something like that. 
740. Ish. Yeah, she's right around there. Okay, yeah. 730 to 740. We'll say that. Um, but the idea here is, which was really cool, is right in this first line. Our purpose here is to show specifically how a simple goal, for example, like rowing a seven minute 2K, right? So this isn't <laughs> about this. It is the concept of training for a goal, as you put so eloquently when we started. Like rowing a sub seven minute 2K row can not only be systematically and deliberately approached from multiple protocols, but can generally encourage similar thinking and pursuing other fitness milestones. For all the points and purposes of this two-page article, this is huge for new programmers, coaches, and athletes alike. Yeah, and that's why it fits so well. I mean, yes, I know we're doing the book club thing, but it fits so well in our world of get with the programming because it's not just do the same thing all the time. And we CrossFit has been hit with the random, random, random and how that doesn't get you to a goal and that you can't use variants or whatever to do, to drive a certain direction. And this single article, it's a page and a half, page and a quarter, really with the diagram at the end, um, that says, that gives you definitive directions using three different ways that all get to the same goal. And all of them have a, even though they're varied um, directions, they are they are a specific path to get to that direction. So it's not a random, you know, just throw throw it out wherever and see what happens, see what sticks on the wall. It is a mm -hmm. planned attack, but using a variety of different ways to get to that to, to that goal. That's that's what's so awesome about it. It's so cool. And uh, rack biceps just came in. What's your drag factor on the rower? Think of this in terms of big picture. Right. And when we talk about nutrition and we say uh, no sugar, like no added sugar, don't tell me about the fruit, like don't worry about drag factor right now, because these basic principles are centering around a achieving a goal. We're used to using the row as an example of how to achieve that goal in different ways to approach this. The other factor is like if you're just talking about your general group class, drag factor doesn't matter. <laughs> like, that's that's too much detail for the purpose. Now, if we had a like rowing team and we're doing like indoor erg training, like yeah, okay, we'll we'll talk about that. For your basic training and programming, it's it's one of those details you don't have to get too much in the weeds. As, although we know where it has its importance. So, as we scroll down here, again, a seven minute two k row that's averaging a one forty five pace for five hundred meters to get there, and it says two approaches. We want to think a distance priority and a time priority. And if you think about that and relate that to programming in general, if you just think about regular CrossFit workouts, you have a task priority, which is do this for time, or a time priority, and here's the time and do as many as you can. In this instance, we have our task as distance on the row. So we go down a little bit, and he says there's three different roads to the same end. Order, the order of increasing intensity is Distance priority, time priority, pace priority. And how would you equate those to say your basic pro programming, right? Because you have basically have like task, time, and intensity. Right. That's how right. I look at that. And if and if you even pull back even further, that is our mantra with CrossFit. It's mastery of the movement, consistency with the movement, and then intensity with the movement. Mastery of the movement is, look, just get to the end of the road here. I don't care how long it takes you to run the mile or to row the 2K. Just get to the end. We want to see that you can do that. And then it's like, okay, well, how fast can you do that? Because we're increasing the intensity. And then the level of pace is, how long are you holding that intensity? So I love the fact that it breaks those three things, those three sets down. But they are all similar ways to get to the same place. Yeah. And, and, I, and I like what you, your time out there is that, when we look at scaling sometimes too, we, we look at that in order too. It's like, okay, if we're going to scale, maybe we'll look at mm, reps and weight, right? And that's task. And then we'll say, okay, what's the time frame that we're working with? And that usually we look at modifies maybe those reps and weight. And then you look at pace priorities, like, okay, what's the intensity? What's the stimulus that we're chasing? And those three things, should all be working together, even right. though there are three separate ways to approach this. So as he has below here is that three metabolically distinct yet convergent paths, what we're just saying, 
to the seven minute goal offer great psychological and physiological advantage over any of the individual approaches alone. Meaning if you're always working distance, you're leaving two things off the table that can improve your row pace, your row time. If you're only working time, say it's like, okay, we're always going to do six by 500 meter rows that, or you're going to do a 5k, a 6k, a 7k, a 1k, only just changing distance. Time priority is that interval work. Right? If you're only doing intervals and you're never doing the bulk sets, right? And if you're never working your pace, like none of those individually can work well. And it's the same thing with any other program that you have. Like, okay, I want to improve my max unbroken set of pull-ups. It's like, okay, so would you just always just r- jump up every training session and just do a max? Or would you do... <laughs> you know how often that happens? <laughs> right. I see, that, I see someone over on the side all the time like, Wait, what are you doing over there? I'm just trying to see how many I can get day after day after day. It's like, ah, all that's going to do is piss you off. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. And so like the approach is there. It's like, okay, the approach of only doing distance is like, oh, okay, I'm always going to hop on a pull-up bar every Wednesday and do a max unbroken set of strict pull-ups. It's like, okay, well, you're leaving a lot of things off the table. What about 10 sets of three, one set every 30 seconds? What about weighted pull-ups? What about banded pull-ups? take the weight off and work the high. Like there are so many different ways to achieve the same thing for the same instance that we're using here. And you can apply that to anything. I mean, think it's like, well, okay, Bill, improve my one rep max back squat. It's like, okay, we'll just max out every Wednesday. Like, no, 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 that's not what I'm going to do. Right? right. Like give uh, three examples of three different ways to improve that. Um, you can do uh, a certain percentage amount every minute on the minute so you can build your capacity set up. You can do pauses down at the bottom at whatever percentages that you want to do so you can build the bottom part of that squat so you can get out of the hole. You can do classic pyramid-type styles where you build up, you know, with uh, using rest in between and doing a set of seven, a set of five, or, yeah, like Brandon said, five by five is the same setup that way. Um I mean, geez, I could keep on going. I mean, you could set up right. where you do that, that like a like a uh, a Romanel. What is it? The, uh, uh, the oh five three God. one. Yeah, any of those. Yeah. I mean, you can do those same type of thing where you go five three one, and then you increase your percentage every single week as you're getting uh, progressively stronger and successful with you, with each one of those lifts. Those are those are fine to do. To me, they're boring. Mm-hmm. I like doing, I love doing tempoed stuff. I love doing every minute on the minute one because it keeps my class on task. And it allows everyone to be able to stay in the in the in the game with with their rep set, but big sets, small sets. Yep. Um, any yeah, of those. You're saying these like there's a 15 different suggestions on, on how yeah. to do that, and you're all correct. Right. They all and work. The reason is they all work, but they all work with variants within each other. Mm-hmm. It's not just one. It's not just five by five or five, three, one, like a starting strength or things like that, or bands or chains or isometric accessory works or Romanian deadlifts and Bulgarian split squats. Like all of these things have their place. And the point is, if you have a singular goal, there shouldn't be a singular path to achieve that. And it can apply to everything. It can apply to, Hey, I want a sub seven minute Helen which is, you know, that's platinum standard for Helen. Three rounds, four in a meter run, 21 kettlebell swings at 53 and 35 all the way up and 12 pull-ups. That was like a big benchmark, what, 15 years ago that everybody's trying to do? Like OBT was trying to do it. Everybody, you know, I did it. I'm just saying I did it. I did it back. Have that stupid workout. (laughs) But that's what I'm saying. It's like, okay, uh, or it's like break 10. How would you do it? Like, well, we don't do Helen every week. Maybe you do heavy Helen. You do interval Helen. You do track work only, working on your running speed. You do that right um, there would be me. That's the only way I would get better at Helen. I just have to do do track work. (laughs) Yeah. And so so the title of this, how to get a seven sub seven minute 2K, is misleading in terms of we're going to talk about how to do this specifically. But it's this overall arching mindset is that you have so many different paths to achieve that singular goal, except the one thing you can't do is do it singularly focused. It's not just about row. It's not just about intervals. It's not just about pace work. It's about all three. 
Hey, hey, put uh, put Yash's comment up there real fast. Which one? The, um, the problem one. The just about finding. Just about. So Yash, Yash makes a comment on here. It says, okay, yes, we were talking about all the different variances of ways to achieve these goals. And it's just about finding the best one for you. See, but I, I personally disagree with that. And the, rea the reason I disagree with really? that is because I don't think that it's finding the one that works best for you. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that, then you are starting to, you're starting to pigeonhole how you respond to whatever it is you're trying to do. Now, granted, if you are a power lifter and you're trying to do your one rep max back squat, or you have a, a specific goal that you are trying to hit, it's a, you know, it's a, a half marathon that you're doing or a triathlon that you're doing. I still think that the variance is what allows you to be better at those things. Like I, I'm doing a lot of stuff right now with, um, and we're programming this a lot, um, even with our, our, our class workouts, is I've moved away or I've kind of cycled away from I don't want to do this for like two cycles. Um, Two-legged squat stuff, unless it's in the workout. All of our strength tests is going to single leg stuff for a while. And we're doing, uh, like we'll do Bulgarian split stuff. We'll do elevated front leg lunges. And we'll do a back squat, front squat, overhead squat. Same setup on that, um, going all the way down. Um, it's weird because it, 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 you feel it in some different places. But I, I think that, what you're doing is you you end up hitting all the corners by trying all of these different things and it allows you to shore up all the holes that you might have instead of having your body because we're so good at compensating around something that our yeah. body will find a way to compensate around it. so usually the things that we don't like are the things that we're not good at so we, yeah. I, I i think that it's we, we need to be uh and not saying that what he was not that his comment is wrong i'm saying that i think that uh Thinking I, I that there is saying. something that that like I well you know the the classic li uh, linear progression only that's what works best for me. It's like no, that's because what you're that's what you're used to. That's what you mm. like to do usually, yeah. usually. And I'm not saying that he's saying that this way. I just I really agree and believe in the idea of do a bunch of different things like that with the same mm -hmm. goal. Keep driving it, just like you know, set up certain cycles or whatever. But you can have strength cycles aren't always the same way to do the strength, like just like what yeah. we were saying earlier. Um, try different ways to do it and f get some different re um, uh, responses and so, you know different stimulus out of that. Mm -hmm. I find that interesting. That's your interpretation of that uh, statement. Well, I it, I wasn't saying. Well, I, 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 well, I think, I think it was more of a don't get uh, stuck in the classic. I, and, yeah, no, and, and, and I know what you mean. And it's funny. It's like when I read it, I was like, yes, <laughs> actually, <laughs> like almost the complete opposite way, which is really funny because so I'll, I'll take myself, for example, the best format that you, works for me that I found over almost 15 years and tens of different squat cycles I've ever done. Like I've done pretty much every single one you could possibly do on the planet, including a small off a half one uh like all of these things i've done i've tried it all and i found i had the best adaptation to stimulus wise was chains and tempo work so for example where i fail in a squat is usually above parallel yeah rarely do i get pinned in the bottom so for me the chain work allowed me to get out of the bottom with speed and work that continually um how the hell do you get stuck above parallel i can't do it i can't i don't know why and a lot of it has to do with my like thoracic stability which is why i'm oh, trash at those got front spots got it got so it i'm very upright at the bottom and as i come up that weight will just kind of <laughs> start pulling me forward and so chains was really huge for my ability to basically finish the lifts so i could train that without the fatigue at the bottom and the other one was tempo work where I could control my body positioning the entire time without a maximal load. Um, yeah. But I know exactly what you're saying. I'm just giving a different perspective on almost the way I saw it. Right. Now, that's not the only way I do squats, but those are some of the best ones for my deficiencies in my actual squat. And maybe that's another avenue that people need to think about is that when we say what works best for them, it's mostly is like what works their biggest personal deficiencies i can see that if that if that's if that's what we're talking about i i agree with that yeah. um 
And and Mike Mike Michael Hudson had a had a comment here. Um, is the goal the result or the variance? And the goal is to hit the goal. It's to get the result. But and when I and when we're talking variance, that doesn't mean that you vary it so much on your path on the first shot that you don't have a direction on that variance. Like you don't go, um, you don't go where you're doing one rep maxes all the time. Then you're doing chain work. Then you're doing tempo work. Then you're doing this and you're doing like without, with, with spreading it so wide that you don't have a direction anymore. I think that you should run those. I think you should run those variances through cycles yeah. of single leg work. Then you go to, um, uh, capacities type work. Then you go to more of a classical linear style. Then you go to accessory. We're going to be hitting certain, specific, you know, certain areas, but you run each of those through whatever, six week, four to six week cycle, whatever. And then you're making those mini jumps, but you're not giving yourself a chance to plateau. Mm -hmm. It's not like doing small of after small of after small of <laughs> after small of after. I mean, yeah. I know people that have done that and they get, they get the, the, the result, they get the result, then they get broken. You know, yeah, I mean, they're, be, they're, yeah sometime oh, it's, <laughs> it, yeah, it, it can be it can be nasty yeah um all right so a couple examples that they gave in ways to do um this training it says this is wild one was 10 intervals of 42 seconds of work followed by a 30 second break trying to get at or above 200 meters per and when you add those up that pace you need to grow to get that distance in that time frame will get you, say, that sub seven minute. And every time you have a successful set, say the following week, you take off five seconds of rest. And then you keep doing that to where what you want is that time interval to be consistent, right? <laughs> we can't do yeah, yeah. 10 to 42. And, and that was um, a fun thing that they, they threw out there. The other is just a variety of different ways. Like you can see this interval table is like, okay, here's, here's different ways to do these intervals, 42 intervals of 10 seconds of work, which I would just blow my brains out. <laughs> it's way too many, but these are, you know, I think it's like 15 or 15 different ways yeah, to do these intervals to get what you do. And, and honestly, like you could say, Hey, we're going to do a, 12 to 14 week 2k cycle and just do one of these a week if you yeah. can hit all your numbers and then do a test at the end pretty cool yeah. yeah um the the one thing i wanted to highlight off of this outside of just these intervals was this at the bottom here as we're closing it out more important than the particulars of any approach is the variety or breadth of stimulus in moving towards your target you're limited only by your imagination and willpower. Each distinct approach adds a unique advantage to your overall strategy. If you could just give a novice programmer this freedom to just go where their imagination takes them, obviously within some confines of reality, that's really what it's all about. Yeah, I think it, 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 it opens the door to allow people to experiment. Uh, and th this is one thing that I, I, I feel that a lot of um, new programmers, especially the way you get to understand what it is that you're putting together is you need to do it. Mm -hmm. So before you go and have someone do, all right, you're going to do 75 sets of 15 seconds of rowing and 32 seconds. Like you oh. better hop on the rower and know exactly what that feels like and what it mm -hmm. looks like um, so that you understand I, I mean, I, I, I think that's one of the things that, that we have, um, a feather in our cap, a, a strength of ours is that we can write a program and know exactly how it's supposed to hit and how it's supposed to feel and what that stimulus is. We've been to that place with the numbers that we're using. Right. It's not like we're saying, oh, well, you're a strong person, so you should be able to do X, Y, Z. Because, well, if you've never done that, it's a, it, like, that's a, it's a difficult it's a difficult experiment to have. So I think that it's important to understand what it's, what it is that it will feel like that you're trying to do. And then you can kind of, I mean, like if you're a programmer, you can kind of gauge up. I mean, that's not to say that every coach has to be an elite level athlete, but they have to understand what it is that they're handing to someone. 
if yeah. they have no idea what that stimulus is going to be, then I, I think that um, they are doing a disservice to the person that they're giving the, the, the workout to, the training to. Yeah. The, uh, the last part here that we have highlighted in yellow is this particular goal, obviously we're talking about the 2K, is a prominent benchmark in an athlete's development. So yes, we're using the seven-minute 2K as, a, as a, basically a little example, but having a sub-seven-minute 2K takes time and is not easy to do for 95% of us that are just general CrossFitters, and the ability to do that and the training that we go into has a lot of great adaptations just coming from practicing and training like that, like training for a, you know, a certain weight benchmark in your back squat. The thing yeah, I have here yeah. at the end, don't lose sight of the more general lesson of incremental, metabolically distinct, and converging methods contributing to an efficient strategy for success, right? So take that, take that statement in blue and apply this bottom kind of buffer is really the overall goal here is making sure we're using a lot of different, what should I say, constantly varied functional movements executed at high intensity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe I've heard yeah, that heard somewhere. It, right. I heard that somewhere as the way to get a goal, whether it's a 2K row or one rep max back squat or a sub three minute frame. You want to take a different approach to this and not a singular focus. What is just talking about a row set? And I mean, I guess it can apply to this, but if you were to do a, a rowing set with someone, what would be the like? What's a, like a what if I say a rowing set? What pops in your head? Just like immediately, pink pops right in there. Uh, for this one, for I mean, for whatever. If if I want to uh, get just, what's it, give me a set, give me a set that you would write up for someone. Uh, I'd say okay, hey, we're working at two K, so three one thousand meters at plus five seconds of your two K PR pace. Okay. okay. Uh, one set every six minutes and so like my 1k row pace would be a sub 130 but my 2k pace would be right about a 137 pr so yeah i could row a thousand meters at a 142 that'll how get me good. how much rest in between it's about two two and a half minutes okay that'll get you there yeah. Yeah. Um that's very right. uh that's very henshaw ish. Henshaw esque. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just like harkening back to like, you know, my background is endurance, aerobic, I mean swimming, triathlons. That was right. my background prior to CrossFit. So like when it comes like running sets, rowing sets, like that's that's more <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I when I but I li I like that. I, I like how you give your your buffer with your 10 seconds over your blah, blah, blah pace, whatever it is that you're, that you're working on. Um, yeah. I, I really like the, um, the, the pace sets 10, five hundreds, one minute rest in between 10, five hundreds on this time frame. We got to go between this and this or a sub whatever. Um, because just looking for capacity being, I like the idea of being able to hold a particular pace for X amount of time and building a wide base at that level yeah. to be able to bump up um, after that. I mean, the, usually most of the time, especially with, with, within our sport, um, I think it's relatively rare. No, fuck it. I'll say it's rare. It is rare <laughs> to where, to where the row counts or where the run counts. Like it's yeah. in there. It's that piece that like, okay, if you do it too much, you're going to hurt yourself, but you aren't going to win the event on that. Like the, the, the row, the way they did the row this time was the first time that like the row mattered without it being like, all right, guys, you're going to race for 2k. Like the whole damn thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, that yeah. really set it where you couldn't just pace it. You had to know you could do it. You had to go, um, to that, to that level. So I, 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 I really like building the capacity like those the pace set I, ideas this I, I I think I tend to gravitate towards that I really like mm -hmm. that idea but for a new person I like the idea also like if we we're talking way deconditioned mm -hmm. okay it, it's similar to when people say that they want to get in shape and they go to the gym or and they run on the treadmill for for they're gonna do 10 minutes on the treadmill yeah. or they're gonna they're gonna do 
I'm going to do three miles and it's going to take me 30 minutes. So I'm just going to set it for three miles at 30 minutes. And they do that and they do that and they do that and they do that. And they get to where they can do that. And then all of a sudden their fitness goes up when they're not in shape to get that it plateaus. And then eventually it actually goes down mm. because they're not gaining anything out of that anymore. Cause they didn't yeah. make that adjustment. So I like the idea of, okay, try to increase the distance you can go in this amount of time. I, th I think yeah. that's, that's kind of cool too. Yeah. It's been fun. It is fun. And there's, it, like I said, there's so many different ways we did a, a 12 week cycle of 500 meter row. So, you know, with a bunch of other things, like it was just like our Tuesday things like, Hey, yeah, we're going to, yeah. on Tuesdays, we're going to be training for 500. So we, you know, the week one of the 12 week cycle, everybody time trialed their 500 meter rope. And then we made programming that had pacing dictated off that PR. You should totally throw in a, Hey, Ashley, right now. See I know, hey, Ashley. Down road, right? <laughs> <laughs> trying to walk behind me. That's a mirror behind me. <laughs> so, yeah. so she has no hey wife. Ashley block. Hey, hey Ashley right. block. That was my wife. That was my wife. She was like, I'm just gonna sneak around the side. I'm like, sure, mirror. But hey, it's okay. <laughs> but uh, it was really cool. And then at the end, everybody PR'd. I, it was kind of cheating because, like, when is the last time you've ever trained for a 500 meter row for 12 weeks? But like, when everyone PR'd, I was like, this is how great I am. It. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I knew it was, it was a little bit of a party trick. But um, all right, so that was the row article which was the precipice of unique elements of approaching a singular goal through variance in training the next one oh i almost pressed the wrong button i almost hit turn off <laughs> <laughs> is about the the muscle up and what's cool here is obviously this is part of the level one um it's not really i mean we're not going to teach you how to do a muscle up here that's not the purpose of um what we're looking at, but it's the elements that people do really need to pay attention to more. Can you see this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, I should probably close this one out. <laughs> Boop. All right. Now, right off the bat, the what I have in blue, and we've said this before, and when we repeat things, it, it bears repeating and maybe write these things down. And it says the muscle up is astonishingly difficult to perform and is unrivaled in building upper body strength, a critical survival skill, and most amazingly of all, virtually unknown. Meaning you don't see this being done in any place other than a gymnastics facility or a CrossFit gym. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. What's up, Bruce? What's up, Bruce? What's up, Bruce? Welcome to the party. Now, what I have here in red is, though containing a pull-up and a dip, the potency is due to neither. A lot of it's like, oh, I don't have pull-ups or ring dips. Like, that's not the hard part. You can have all the pull-ups and ring dips in the world, but if you don't have, quote, the heart of the muscle-up is the transition from pull-up to dip, the agonizing moment when you don't know if you're above or below. When learning a muscle-up, this drove me absolutely insane because i had a lot of strict pull-ups in my bag and a lot of dips just from swimming training yeah yeah but i could not get above the damn rings to utilize either one of them it was so maddening for me i don't know what it's like for you learning your first muscle up unless you're that uh, asshole that did it on the first try uh nah uh, i was i was decent i was decent at it i was decent at it um i remember so i think getting one was wasn't that bad it was getting multiples that pissed me off mm. because i didn't have that that little bone on your wrist right there like from the false grip from sitting oh, on that thing so that gnarly. comes in later in the article <laughs> oh man like i would just bleed the fuck out of that thing all the time and then i'd be at then i was like well now i can't do muscle ups for like three weeks so i remember it and it was weird back if you have been doing this a while like we didn't have the kip we didn't have the big open like all that all yeah. that was kind of discovered on the fly almost at your games at the 2010 games when they did yeah, Amanda. like yeah. that's where everyone's yeah. like trying to make shit up as they went so we didn't really know how to do that so i i it's all it is strange to me 
that the ring muscle up, the the strict ring muscle up is like a forgotten art. Like nobody wants to even go to that. They don't want to. It's like, why am I? No, but I got to swing. I don't need to be on the ground here on my shins. What are you talking about? Yeah. You know, what do you mean? Put my what do you mean? Put the butt of my hand on that. Like, I don't understand what, what are we talking about? I'm yeah. supposed to be flying through the air right now. What's up? <laughs> I, I liken it to, do you remember the movie shooter with yeah. Mark Wahlberg and he was the sniper yeah. and he was visiting that like old tinfoil hat dude. And he's like rubbing his calluses to see if who the real gunny is. Yeah. I feel like if you want to see an old school CrossFitter, they still have like dark circles underneath their wrist. Oh yeah. From years. Yeah. Of Strict's and I like what you pointed out there. This article, as you said, is almost 20 years old. We are only talking about the strict ring muscle up. Yep. This article is designed for the strict ring muscle up, not kipping. Um, a- as you pointed out. But um, the the red part I have in here is the transition. That moment can last from fractions of seconds to dozens. <laughs> <laughs> Which I have seen. How many? How many oh, Instagram God. videos are there? <laughs> People just like a worm on a hook, or that like a what? What is it like? You see those videos of like cats get stuck in a branch and they're just kind of swinging from the base, right? <laughs> but as it says below, no other movement can deliver the same upper body strength. Period. You're going to hear this a lot, and as we get deeper into this. We're going to tell you why certain scales over the years have been misinterpreted, partly because of this article and how people assessed what they're meant in this article that we hope to clear up. Now, here's the funny part. Here's the four-step process of doing a (laughs) muscle-up. Hang from a false grip. Pull the rings to your chest or, quote, pull up. Roll your chest over the bottom of the rings and then press to support the dip. It's that simple as it says. It's just that easy. <laughs> it's just that easy. It's just that easy. Now, the trick here that we have in yellow is the false grip. And this is where we're saying where we rip the most time is the false grip shortens the lever arm, which greatly improves your strength, meaning you're always stronger closer to your core than you are further away. Talking about leverage or lever arms. And the example I like to put in people's heads if they can't think about it is think about you're holding a 45 pound plate on your chest and then every 10 seconds you just move it an inch away and an inch away and an inch away and it gets compoundingly more difficult to sustain that not just for the time but the stability and it's the same thing for the rings the further you are away from your chest the less power and and ability you have to roll over the top of the rings which always is a huge um, mistake that we have oh went too fast sorry no false grip no muscle up again strict and i love what they have here at the bottom is this part is really very easy (laughs) once you figure it out right and it has some tips here but when when you talk about the false grip muscle up when I think about like all the years that I've ripped something on my hands, whether it's palms for pull-ups or pinkies for kettlebell swings or, you know, thumbs in here and the, the rips I would get from false grip muscle-ups were probably the worst. Yeah. It, it, my it, because of that, because of that, it's one thing like, so when you tear on your palm, it's this nice soft flesh area. When you tear on your <laughs> finger, it's like, it's still that soft fleshy area. When you, tear on that bone it's not because you pulled the skin and it tore Mm -hmm. like like there was a a callus there and you tore it that way it's because you put all your weight on your bone and then smashed your skin between your bone and the wood or the plastic of that ring and then tried to move around on that thing and you ground the shit out of it and it's super thin and it like it doesn't heal it's like if you were to take your knee and just beat it on the cement a bunch of times. That ends up being the same kind of wound. It's a bruise mm-hmm. and and an open cut all at the same time. And then it never wants to heal because it's right, like, constantly <laughs> pull that thing. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, or what's the, when you get it, like, in the crease of your finger, between your palm and the base of your finger? Yeah. You ever got one yeah. of those ripped yeah. where, it, like, I rip my callus all in the way the line. to the base <laughs> of my finger? Yeah. 
I was like, oh, I guess I can't have to keep my hands open or closed until right, for like the next like week and a half. But yeah, man, those false false grip rips were the worst. Um, it has some tips on getting your chest over the rings. It'll really show you the photos here that they have. Although photo two is not really coming out. Um, when it has these five tips, the big thing here in red is what I love is ultimately none of these tips will help. You just have to struggle with it until you get it. And this is classic gymnastics thought for people who quit early. Because if you constantly miss, say, a snatch, everybody wants to try again. And it doesn't bother them. Oh, God, I almost got it. Or I'm right there. Like, that's, that's their first train of thought. But if you miss a handstand push-up or a pull-up or a muscle-up, they're like, fuck it, I quit. It's mind-blowing. That is really weird. It, right? Do you, I mean, we think about that. It's like, and I think some of it is because they – they put the blame on themselves because there's nothing to put the blame on before. It's like, Oh, you know, the barbell and the weights and like, those are why I'm not getting it. Right. But when it's just you and your body in space, you're like, I don't like to say it. I'm the problem. And yeah, so that, people that. get so much more frustrated with gymnastics than they will with any other movement, whether it's like any other movement. I remember Vellner saying that, making a comment about that where he was saying that, you know, what are you, what are you going to do if they no rep you or if they have this thing that happens, does that ever rattle you? And he's like, he's like, man, I come from gymnastics. You, you never got it right. You never mm -hmm. got it to count. It never works. So you're so used to hitting fail, 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 that it's like, oh, okay, okay. It's that it's like, you don't even blink about it. Whereas yeah. people that don't have that don't constantly get slapped, you know, not correct, not correct. Didn't get it. Didn't get failed, failed, failed they take that almost as personal right. rather than being like, Oh, I'm right there. Oh, I felt yeah. that piece. Oh, there's the next step. There's the next step and not letting themselves, um, accept all of the little 1% improvements. Mm -hmm. They want a 95% improvement right then. Yep. And with gymnastics stuff, like it just does not happen that way. Yeah. Yeah. At all. I'm talking to certain people that may be on this, podcast right. now, <laughs> as, we're, as we're talking about right. it, it it happens that way you know so right. um yeah. you have to be able to <laughs> acknowledge the one percent mm -hmm. and be stoked on the one percent and then uh not be flustered because it was only one percent what's up mike hey. what's up, mike oh, sorry that's my fault oh i thought we were doing a live call into all yeah. of a sudden i was like uh, what? yeah we yeah. got the number <laughs> i guess i could <laughs> uh what's up mike so, yeah, that's that's a little thing to think about when you guys are training is like, oh, wow. Now, I put here in yellow real quick because we've already talked about this, but assuming grip is okay, you'll know it is if you get deep bruises in your wrists opposite of your thumb. And so people are, are like, oh, my wrists hurt. It's like starting to fray and tear and bruise. I'm like, good, you're doing it. Right. Yep, that means you're in the right place. Yeah, you're right. Now, here's what I have in red with a little note. If you can do 15 good pull-ups and 15 good dips, it says then you're strong enough to do a muscle up. And the note I have here, if it opens, damn it, letting me down note. All right, well the note is, this isn't an appropriate scale for ring muscle ups. Ring dips and pull ups, ring dips and pull ups, like, the no. Two, the, you mean the, the two ring two ring muscle ups equals two pull ups and two dips or like hey yeah or one that ring was muscle up. that was the original setup that was the original yeah but of... the thing is is like it's in this article it says you can have all the pull ups and dips in the world but if you want to get a muscle up you have to learn the transition 100% and, and totally. i think people took this and like oh it's always pull ups and ring dips and like you said there's not one scale fits all there's not one scale right. you always do but when you have this in a class like program muscle ups for your class. It's okay that everyone has to do low ring transfers. You can make a low ring transfer just as difficult for the elite athlete to do a ring muscle up. And yet you're learning the most difficult part of the ring muscle up, assuming you have the pull ups and ring dips. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll combine a pull up or version of with a low ring transfer as a substitute per a ring muscle up. But just the pull-ups and dips only, I think we got – there was a time where, yeah, it was a scale, and then everyone's like, okay, that's 
that's the only thing we do. And then he said, he's like, I have all the pull-ups and dips in the world, but I still can't do a muscle up. I don't understand. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Still unable to get above the rings. Oh, this is, <laughs> this is, uh, my favorite line of the whole. Personal <laughs> yeah, I know, totally. <laughs> Still unable to get above the rings, and you're either letting the rings wander away from your body, or my favorite line in the whole article, or you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine giving that cue in a gym and just like not batting an eye. Oh, but I can't. It's like you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> And we see that all the time. I see that when people try to learn multiple pull-ups in a row. It's like they do one, the second one feels weird, and then they quit. Yeah. 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 And so that was great. It's like you're just not trying hard enough. And it's true, but to encourage it is don't give up on each attempt unless you struggle for 10 seconds with the rings at the chest. Because learning what that position feels like and what you have to do to get in that position is huge for your development to understand what it really requires to do the ring muscle up. Instead of be like, oh, not going to make it, quit. It's like you weren't even in the right position. At least struggle in the right position. It'd be like going down for a heavy back squat and halfway down there, you just drop the bar. You're like, I'm not going to make it. It's like, or sit at the bottom and know what that feels like for a yeah. second before you bail off your back. Not with well, someone spotting you from behind. And that, and that doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean that, you know, I've seen people struggle with the ring muscle up, but they're struggling in the wrong place. Right. Like they're struggling, right. like they're not struggling with their hands, their 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 fists next to each other and the rings being down by their sternum and they're trying to pull it to the side. They're struggling here like this. They do their pull, they kick up to here, and then they're struggling. It's like, well, okay, yes, you're trying really hard right now, but where you're trying, you don't ever want to be doing that anyway. So just come down. Like, don't waste your time there. You got to struggle in the right places. So, I mean, that's one of the pluses about being in a, in a CrossFit gym, hopefully, is that you have a coach that's seeing you do it and telling you where you're messing up. Mm -hmm. Like, don't let someone sit here with the rings out here and try to do the thing where they push their hand out to the side and try to hook, cherry hook, chicken wing hook their elbow. Yeah over the top like that i get it but like the the only time i would do that i would do that is if it's at the open and it's like look man okay we're not we're not working on our fitness right now we're working on like here's the line you got to get to the line so whatever it takes to get there um and then throw these questions throw these comments up about the which is easier to start a bar oh or yeah I was a ring muscle up well, it yeah. wasn't easier. It says for be for a beginner, oh, for a beginner. Be best to start with a bar or ring. And uh, Yasha's Yosh, comment was, "Bar is easier." It's like, yes, bar is well, different. Well, it's different. Yeah, not easier yeah. or harder or or. But he said, "Where should this start?" And you and I both said the same thing. Yeah, if I mean, yeah. I want someone. If I want someone to learn how to do, or to 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 move themselves towards a ring muscle up, you have to do the ring muscle up. And you have to do the drills and scales and modifications and adjustments and all of the pieces into that ring muscle up. It would be like saying, well, how do I get better at, at rowing? Okay, well, you should go run. Mm. It's a monostructural thing. It's like, well, no, that's well, not going to be better. The question is which one to start with first, not yeah, just if, for well, the ring muscle Well, but that's, that's, that's what I mean. If you, want them, if you want them to learn a bar muscle up, you yeah. start them on the bar. If you want them yeah. to learn a ring muscle up, you start them on a ring yeah. um, and you move the directions in that. I, I don't think that because the idea of hanging under something and ending up on top of something automatically means that they're the same movement because mm -hmm. one is, I mean, because one is a standard object that's, that you can push against the other one, you move uh, yeah. free. I mean, it, it's a different movement. Yeah. So I, I don't like to substitute in, in, I, I will say that oh, in our yes. regular class, I, I will have it as an option if someone wants to do that, because, okay, we're not going to take the whole day today and learn how to do the ring muscle up. That'll be on a Thursdays when we do our technique yeah. day, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. but if you want to get this, here's what we'll do. It's like, okay, one-to-one -one on the ring muscle up or your transitions or your jumping ring muscle ups or from the, from the floor, if you have, have, you know, a difficult time getting up and doing the dip, or if you want to do the bar muscle up, okay, we're still going to go one-to-one with the number 
rather than saying like it's pull-ups and dips, it's, we'll go this way, but you're not going to get an RX out of it. You're not going to get whatever. It's just another element, a gymnastic pulling, pushing mm -hmm. movement that we'll throw in there so that we get the stimulus of the event rather than whatever. It kind of depends on what their goals are too. Yeah. Well, okay. Quick question. Yeah. If you were saying pick which one to teach first, which one would you start with? Um, I would, well, I think it would be easiest to go through the movements at a learning pace on the rings. I agree. Because you can start them on the ground. Yeah. You can have them slowly move and understand, like you can't do that on a bar. I mean, you right. kind of can, I guess, but I, I just think that it would be, I, I just think the ring would be easier. I agree. Uh, I have here in yeah. blue. We're about talking about the difficulty of the ring muscle up. And he's like, how hard is it? It's actually not that hard. <laughs> this is a classic. Gymnastics <laughs> moves are graded A through E. A being the easiest and E being the hardest. The ring muscle up, sorry, everybody, is an A move. And the best part is we always, the, the classic is like, the ring muscle up isn't even a gymnastics movement in competition. It's not a move. It's the equivalent no. from standing, getting on top of the blocks before you start a swimming event. It's just how they yes. get on top of the rings. <laughs> like, it's the equivalent of stepping up onto an object for gymnasts. That's the <laughs> level of difficulty that we're talking about here, which I think is cool when we look back at the CrossFit Games program that Boz had this past year was, as he said, we are so far away from the elite gymnasts in our capacity as CrossFit athletes versus our two other distance or, or any type of monostructural movement and weightlifting. And that's a great example. Our premium pulling movement that we have as like the precipice of strength development and upper body pulling is not barely on the scale for regular gymnasts, specifically male gymnasts. Obviously women gymnasts don't do ring routines um, in there, but I thought that was always a great little eye-opening experience for people. Um, but once you do get it, anything can, you can get a finger hold on, you can surmount and they, you know, talk about professions, military, police, firefighters. The one thing I thought was cool and I never really thought of was the application into things like wrestling and jujitsu, um, more so jujitsu because, you know, jujitsu involves a lot of grabbing of the gi and like, I didn't even think about that until they said it, but like that false grip strengthening. When you grab $20. someone by their, yeah, their, their, their collar and you turn that in, like that is a huge advantage if you have grip strength in jujitsu specifically, and you can get that through strict, strict ring muscle up training. Well, yeah. And I, I think it's imperative that we keep putting the strict word in there because granted the majority of people that are going to be, that are probably listening to this right now, when they think ring muscle up, they just see the flying garbanzo beans flying through the air with the greatest of ease, you know, whipping themselves up into the air. And that is not mm -hmm. the muscle up that we're talking about. Yep. Uh, and then the close things out here is they gave some eff effective workouts for those that are learning. It's like, you can give them a little push from the bottom. You want to push up, never out. Like don't push them over in front of the rings, push them up to it. Um, but an example of 30 muscle ups for time Amazing. would be a good workout for most people. Then it said 50 will be covered the needs of the elite barbarians. <laughs> Which, <laughs> you're not, you're not wrong, but November, 2002 is when this article came out. So we're approaching the 20 year mark when this came out and we're getting the first basically drop of 30 ring muscle ups for time as a benchmark test. Yeah. It's still not named Briggs. <laughs> I know. Come on, man. You got the inside track now. You got your foot in the door over there in the big HQ. So put some pressure on people. Yeah. yeah. Where's the application? <laughs> the girl benchmark application. Uh, and do, that, do that on your morning coffee call. Come on now. Yeah, I, I, I'll bring that up. Uh, excuse me, Don. Yes, Mr. CEO. Can we? <laughs> Don, I know um, pull it together, together, bro. Yeah. Pull it together. <laughs> 30 ring muscle ups for time, Briggs. 30 bar muscle ups for time, Samantha. Samantha. Yeah. We're just going to keep saying that. We started this two and a half years ago, and we'll say it until it is, and then you know someone else will take the credit for it because they'll post it. <laughs> uh, at the very end, rings were a regular feature of gymnasiums, which is really like um, facilities at where you train gymnastics, gymnasiums, until 
modern times. And yes, there's no facility like modern day at the time, right? 20 years ago, any fitness boutique facility that had rings hanging from the ceiling other than a gymnasium, which is where most gymnasts would be training if you put that, or at this point in time, a garage gym. They were so fun. Yeah. There, I remember yeah. being like seven years old. My dad was the wrestling coach and we'd go at the high school and we would go there and they would have all those things. Rings hanging from the uh, the rack ladder. What mm -hmm. is that ladder called? A stretching ladder that they would use for oh, gymnastics. Oh, Thatcher ladder? Is that what they call that? I can't I remember what it was. So. It's, I know it's like wood, all the, the wood, wood goes up and it's yeah, got yeah, the yeah. thing that comes across. Yeah, and there would always be rings hanging up on that, always. And we would be on those things all the time. Yeah. All the time. Yep. And that's it. Man. Simple little things like little nuggets in here, the value and the importance of learning how to do a ring muscle up, just training for that right here in full circle with the two articles, training for a singular thing, ring muscle up, the adaptation you're going to develop for upper body pulling and pressing strength, as well as core stability and kinesthetic awareness, which is yeah. your ability to move your body in space by just trying to get your first muscle up has way more transferability to your overall fitness level than you can imagine. Doing something as simple as training for a 2K row at a certain time frame, whatever your time goal is, and the different modalities that you need to train in, whether it's distance, intervals, or intensity, apply that to any goal that you ever ha that you have in any fitness facet you want. It's all there. Think about so one of the things that CrossFit gyms have always been knocked on is, you know, I we do Olympic lifting here. And that's just too difficult. People don't, you know, I'm 70. I don't need to know how to do the snatch. I don't need to, I don't give a shit about ring muscle. I don't need to learn how to do any of that stuff. And every single person, every single owner or person in a box or crossfitter that comes in contact with that conversation should say exactly why working through ring muscle ups are important. It's not about the fact of can you do an A level movement in a gymnastic level anything, or can you do 30 for time? It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact of pulling yourself up from under something to over something. And there isn't any 70 year old that if they fall down, mm. isn't going to have to be able to grab themselves and pull themselves up and go over whatever to get on the phone and say at that point, yeah, I fell. But I got back up. Not that I can't get back up. I got back up, but my leg hurts. Can you have someone come over and, and, and check out my leg? Whatever. I mean, what, whatever. Mm -hmm. That is why we need to learn that movement. That is why it's imperative that we do rings. What, and I mean, take, a, take someone sitting, a, a, a paraplegic, have them sitting in their chair, pulling up the rings, put, pushing themselves up and over. Yeah. Change the height of the rings if you need to adjust that like the rings are not just a scale for for ring rows like that is not the only that or the 30 the 30 ring muscle ups for time yeah it is a training tool for the and we're talking crossfit the elite level athlete and the aging grandparent the training does not differ by type but by intensity so if they are if the elites are doing rings and snatches and single arm whatever's Everybody should be doing their version of that. Should be. So, boom. There. I'm not even going to mess with that. Take that some of them perfectly apples. Said. Perfectly said. Well, th guys, thanks for joining us for the CrossFit Journal Book Club today. Articles four and five. We drop those in the chat. They're also in the detailed description on our YouTube page. If you guys follow us on Patreon, go to patreon.com. Be a programmatron. And we love, I got to love that nickname. It is that was super great. cool. For six bucks a month, you guys can support the show more than you already do. We will upload the detailed version of these articles into our latest posts as well as mail those out to you guys. The next article we have coming up on the Glassman Chipper. Ooh, now we're getting into the weeds. The glycemic index. You want to see the effects of refined carbohydrates on your system? The reason why we have chronic disease is the number one killer in the united states check that out just drop the link in the chat if you guys follow us on patreon we'll upload this for you guys as well coming up but bill dude yeah 
That was great. That was a fun one. I'm that glad we put fun. the two together. I'm glad we put the two together. Yeah, they they married very well as far as yeah. like training can develop a lot of the things you want to and the different facets that you can center around a singular focus on. Thank you guys for joining us. We really appreciate it. See you guys next week. Article number Bye, seven. guys.